The next panel is on politics of collusion. It's chaired by Peter Tatchell, who is a human rights campaigner. He's been uh, campaigning for many years, since 1967. Um, I have it here. Uh, he's been awarded many uh, prizes, and uh, including the Observer Ethical Award for Human Rights Campaign of the Year in 2006, Secularist of the Year Award in 2012 by National Secular Society. He's a broadcaster. He writes on many issues. He interrupted um, um, Archbishop of Canterbury, um, Carey, on his Easter, Easter su Sunday um, because he was supporting legal discrimination against uh, 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 LBGT uh, people. Uh, and he, uh, twice I, I take it, I remember once, uh, tried to uh, a citizen arrest of uh, Robert, uh, Robert Mugabe, uh, a president of Zimbabwe then, um, uh, which is uh, on one occasion I think uh, um, Peter has received severe uh, damage and injury to his head. He is a director, currently is director of the human rights organization, the P Peter Tatchell Foundation. So um, please welcome Peter Tatchell and the panel on, uh, on uh, politics of collusion. Peter. Uh, thank you so much. I am so proud to be chairing this session. Um, this whole conference is about the struggle of women in particular communities and nations where there is a huge battle against religious privilege and tyranny, against conservative orthodoxy for the rights of women, which are a universal <laughs> right. And the voices you're hearing on this platform today and throughout this whole conference are some of the most courageous, brave, inspiring women on this planet. The struggle of women for women's rights is the single greatest global struggle of all. Uh, women are half of humanity, yet in every country in the world, still women suffer as second-class citizens and worse. So this conference and the voices of women, minority women, who you will hear today, is a really important aspect of that universal global struggle for women's liberation. I'm going to start by introducing the panel, and we have some very, very distinguished women here on this platform. Women who have devoted much of their lives to fighting for female emancipation, often in circumstances of incredible adversity and at great personal risk. So I'm just going to introduce them, and then we're going to start um, the discussion. So the first person I'd like to, person I'd like to introduce is Bonya Ahmed. Um, she is visiting research scholar at the University of Austin since 2016, working on the rise of Islamic fundamentalism. She's also a published author and moderator um, and of the first platform, online platform from Bengali-speaking free thinkers. Until recently, she worked as a senior director in the finance industry in the USA. She is the widow of Ajit Roy, the well-known writer and blogger and activist who was uh, a founder of the Muktamona blog. And Roy and Ahmed were brutally attacked in the middle of the street by Islamists during a book signing trip to Dhaka, Bangladesh on the 26th of February, 2015. Ahmed was gravely injured uh, during the attack. She continues to work with international and local groups to help Bengali bloggers and activists and to seek justice for Avijat and other murdered uh, campaigners. She's dedicated to drawing attention to the growing culture of impunity in Bangladesh. So Bonya is really an example of someone who has put their own life on the line and lost the person dearest in her life because of Islamist extremism <laughs> and the courage that she uh, and Ajivat showed in fighting against extremism. So please give a big applause. <laughs> At the far end, we have Mariam Ale Lucas who is an Algerian sociologist, political theorist, and author. 
Mariam was born in Algeria to a family of feminists and has been active in liberation struggles in Algeria. She's a founder and former international coordinator of Women Living Under Muslim Laws, a solidarity network that provides information, support, and collective space for women. She's also the founder of Secularism is a Women's Issue, which focuses on the threat of the erosion of secular spaces and of formal secularism. And she challenges all forms of fundamentalism and, again, has taken incredible personal risks to defend women's rights. <laughs> On my left is Pagna Patel, the founder and director of South Old Black Sisters, a multi-award winning, award winning women's organization founded in 1979 to address the needs of black and minority women experiencing gender violence. Uh, SBS has successfully campaigned uh, for the release of Karanjit Olawalia, a landmark case in which an Asian woman was convicted for the murder of her violent husband. That case reformed homicide law, creating awareness within and outside minority communities. Uh, Pragna has been at the forefront of so many of SBS's milestone cases and campaigns on domestic violence, legal aid, immigration, and religious fundamental fundamentalism, which includes mounting successful legal challenges against the practice of gender segregation in schools and universities and against the accommodation of Sharia codes within the legal system. She's also a co-founder of Women Against Fundamentalism and has written extensively on race, gender, and religion, including Faith in the State, question mark, Asian Women's Struggles for Human Rights in the UK, <clears throat> and Shrinking Secular Spaces, Asian Women at the Intersects of Race, Religion, and Gender. She was listed in The Guardian's Top 100 Women, <coughs> Activists, and Campaigners. And again, Pragna has really taken a forefront role in challenging uh, misogyny and patriarchy, particularly with black and Asian communities and done so at great personal demonization and vilification. Another true feminist hero. Uh, Ramana Hashim is a Bangladeshi-born rights activist and political sociologist. She's a spokesperson for the community women against abuse and a former organizer of Nari Dignata, a secular Bangladeshi women's organization here in Britain. She has a PhD in gendered and sexualized violence in the conflict in Southeast Bangladesh. She teaches on an open learning initiative program for asylum seekers and refugees in higher education and at the Department of Social Sciences at the University of East London. Her current research focuses on narratives of sexuality and gendered violence, interconnections between gender, power, and <laughs> politics, the displaced narratives of forced migrants and refugees from the global south. Please give Romana a huge applause. <laughs> Next to Romana is Saida Hamid, a spokesperson of the Council of ex-Muslims of Britain, and she's been featured in a 2016 film called Islam's Non-Believers by award-winning filmmaker Dia Khan, another great feminist icon uh, from minority communities. Um, Saida is also a human rights activist um, against honor-based violence, forced marriage, and FGM. Uh, based in Gloucestershire, she's working in the sexual violence field with a focus on black minority ethnic women. Sadia organized a hugely successful event titled Let's Talk Honor in October 2016, which was held at Gloucester University. She's also launched Critical Sisters and is a winning winner of the IKRWO Special Recognition Activist of the Year 2017. A great, great campaign. <laughs> And 
and next to her is Stasha Ziovich. I, sorry? Did I get it wrong? Stasha Ziovich? <laughs> I won't try it for a third time. Um, is a co-founder and coordinator of Women in Black, Belgrade, in Serbia. She's initiated several women's networks, like Women's Peace Network, the International Network of Women's Solidarity Against War, International Women in Black Network, Network of Conscience Objectors, and Anti-Militarism in Serbia, plus the Coalition for a Secular State. She has organized educational activities focusing on women's human rights, refugee rights, women's peace politics, and women and anti-militarism. Stasha is an author of numerous essays and articles and supplements in local, <coughs> regional, and international media, <coughs> magazines, and publications on women and politics, reproductive rights, war, nationalism, militarism, women's resistance to war, and anti-militarism in general. She's been nominated for and won a range of prizes and awards, including the Millennium Peace Prize, the Honorary Citizenship of Turin, and the Honorary Citizenship of Granada. Please welcome Stasha. So these six women exemplify the incredible her heroism and tenacity of women <coughs> from minority communities. And as I say, I'm so proud to welcome them here today. Um, I'm going to start. Um, I've been asked that we're not going to have any introductory speeches. I'm going to ask the panelists a few questions, and then we're going to open up to you, the <coughs> audience. So we're going to have maximum participation. So the first question I'd like to ask is, this, is about, this session is about the politics of collusion. So I would like to ask each of the panelists briefly, because we've got quite a few questions here, briefly to give examples in their experience of some of the collusion with religious privilege against women's rights the battles they've personally experienced or know about. So I'm wondering if perhaps Pragna can kick off on that. Um, OK, thank you so much. And I, too, am very proud to be here with uh, my co-panelists, some of whom are absolute, my absolute heroes. Um, in my, I mean, all right, let me put it this way. South All Black Sisters has always, always <laughs> challenged the politics of collusion that occurs in relation to the ways in which the state has collaborated with minority community leaderships through official policies of multiculturalism. And I do want to, at this point, make a distinction between multiculturalism as an idea, which is a very important idea, and one that um, the far right and nationalism in, in Europe and elsewhere are trying to trash. So I think the idea of multiculturalism at its best is about organizing and recognizing diversity and, and equality is a very important idea, so we shouldn't bin that. However, the, in terms of the politics of collusion, we've constantly had to challenge the ways in which a social contract has emerged between the British state and minority leaderships. Um, first, under multiculturalism, we had a situation where um, the state was collaborating with um, and, and seeking out leaderships from um, communities who were largely uh, from business classes, who were male, who were religious, and allowing them to set the agenda for minority needs and allowing them to frame uh, minority identities. And we, inevitably, it was a very patriarchal social contract um, that, that had been developed. Um, and under that contract, minority women were being uh, invisibilized and, were being and women's needs were being dismissed. And so, for example, some of the first campaigns that South All Black Sisters waged, uh, were waging were against the ways in which the state refused to intervene 
when young Asian women were reporting forced marriage or reporting domestic violence, not so young, but older women reporting domestic violence. And the state's response was, this is part of your cultural baggage. And we, as a state, are enlightened enough around issues of diversity to allow you to practice these, um, uh, to, to uh, uh, we tolerate these practices, which were really about that social contract, that collusion between state and minority leaderships. And it took us a decade or more to persuade the police or social services and politicians to break with that kind of multicultural consensus because it sold women down the river in terms of their rights. And it was effectively a manifestation of cultural relativism. Um, and we did achieve a, a shift in policy around multiculturalism, and particularly uh, when the issues of honor-based violence and forced marriage uh, began, began to get some kind of public attention. And eventually, we managed to force the government and the state to recognize that the policies of multiculturalism were effectively devoid of any ethical content and were effectively um, uh, imprisoning women within constraints of religious, oppressive religious and cultural um, uh, contexts. That nuanced understanding of multiculturalism that we tried to get the state to accept was one that said that di recognizing diversity didn't mean jettisoning the idea of universality of human rights and the universality of equality, uh, the principle of equality. It was a very short-lived moment because then 9-11 happened and then the London bombings happened and civil unrest in 2001 in the north of England happened. And what we saw paradoxically is a move backwards on the part of the state towards a more integrationist, in a regressive sense, approach to race relations. And in effect, what that, ha what that meant, paradoxically, whilst talking in the language of integration, actually strengthened fundamentalist and ultra-conservative religious leaderships. And those ultra-conservative and religious leaderships are now in positions of immense power. They often masquerade as mod moderates, as Gita outlined in the earlier sessions. And, um, and they are now defining the social contract between state and minorities. And it's what we call the, the faith-based approach to minorities. It's a very regressive approach. And it is this space that's accommodating the most reactionary, the most regressive fundamentalist demands around dress codes, around Sharia laws, around gender segregation in schools, faith-based schools, and so on. Interestingly, all of which are really about the control of women's minds and bodies, <clears throat> essentially. And so this is some of the ways in which we have had to deal with the politics of collusion and we've had to challenge this more re in more recent times through legal challenges using uh, the equality laws, uh, particularly around sex discrimination, you invoking human rights principles. And we've won some interesting and very important challenges around the implementation of Sharia wills, gender segregation in faith-based schools, and, um, and around dress codes as well. But these are really, really challenging times for us. And in, in challenging these things, we've been called neocons, we've been called Islamophobic, we've been called um, imperialists, women in the pay of imperialists, and so on. But that hasn't deterred us, because when you see films like the ones that you saw earlier, when you hear of the struggles that people like Bonya have gone through and others, um, we realize that we really are on the right side of history. Just so we can get through all the questions yes. and also make sure that you, the audience, have a chance to speak, I'm going to ask the panelists to try and limit their contribution to about two or three minutes at the maximum. So yes. bear with me. I, sh I should have told you, but don't, don't worry, you're fine. Um, so let's, let's hear from Bonya. I'll be short. <laughs> Uh, this whole topic of uh, 
politics of collusion is such a broad topic. Don't know where to start, especially, mm. you know, the two places I call home, I can call home, is um, our Bangladesh and America. There is so much to talk about in both of these places. In, in very, you know, we are weirdly uh, similar but opposite ways. After Trump in America and what is happening in Bangladesh, uh, um, I, I guess we will talk about it more as we go along um, in the, during the panel discussion. So this, this politics of collusion is so much, it, it's very interestingly so much related to uh, women's reproductive rights, uh, uh, you know, uh, our fights against patriarchy, uh, racism, immigration, you know, and also in case, in, in, in case of America, these are all uh, the topics that which have come up right now, come, like they are in the forefront right now. In, in countries like Bangladesh, uh, it's not about racism, but it's so much about uh, minority rights. It's so much about uh, fights against patriarchy, misogyny, uh, women's rights, you know, the, the religious, uh, the, the attacks from the religious fundamentalists on the rights of women. Uh, right now, the Prime Minister of Bangladesh is actually co-opting with a group, with a religious group, who demanded the heads or demanded the lives of the atheist bloggers in 2013. We are seeing the Prime Minister sitting on the same table with them and exchanging vows and, um, you know, and, and um, legalizing their madrasa degrees as one of the higher uh, graduate degrees in Bangladesh. These are the people who actually asked to stop the co-ed education, they, uh, they demanded that the women's education, women should not be educated after a certain age. And um, the government of Bangladesh, the so-called secular government of Bangladesh, is very comfortable to co-opt with them. So I guess this is such a broad topic that we will, uh, we will come back to it later and um, as we go along with the conversation today uh, in this panel. Mm. I'm going to ask Ramana next, but I just want to add that um, she is currently on an Islamist hit list uh, since 2015. She cannot go back to Bangladesh. Her life is in serious danger because of her activism and because of her speaking out for women's rights and other issues. So I'll give it to you. Thank you. Um, yes, um, I couldn't go home yet. But hopefully one day, I'm a positive person. Try to be. So things may change. Things may get better if we keep working. So in the politics of collision topic, I mean, as already um, Bonadi, I call her Bonadi because Didi means sister. And in Bangladesh, we have a culture. If they are senior, you must call them sister or brother. So Bonadi said already something about Bangladesh. So I don't want to go back to Bangladesh. Bangladesh doesn't quite like me so at the moment. So collusion for me, as a, I, I should also say that I'm actually currently based in the University of Warwick. Um, I started in September, long, long after uh, the, the biographies were published. So I teach uh, uh, politics <laughs> uh, in the Department of Inter Politics and International Studies. And that also brought some new reflections in my understanding of the politics of collision. So for me, you know, collision occurs at different levels. The three major levels is one is the direct and macro level collision, which Pragnadi, I also call her Didi because she's senior. So Pragnadi also <laughs> <laughs> explained. That, uh, by, that happens by the state and other structures of power, such as parliament, joint committee, like we had been seeing what the joint committee and the subcommittee has, been, has done with our Sharia complaint. 
and uh, also legitimizing religious laws by enabling religious codes, in this case, Sharia councils in the UK and uh, in the context of Bangladesh, madrasas, uh, uh, a close Bangladesh, madrasas and mosques. I don't know if you are aware that the, the Prime Minister has given a new approval in Bangladesh to build new mosques. And so to represent, we are really holy nation. So these are like the macro level, but then what happens when we go to the micro level? This is the second level, and that is more complex to me. Uh, um, this is like through families, community groups, social organizations, interest groups, and even individuals who act as agents of collusion or individual colluders in the name of culture and individual um, choice. They have choice. In this case, the women in hijab who argue that hijab is a choice and women's rights in, in the UK or in US. These women, when they are back in Bangladesh, they would be slaughtered for their way of dressing. You know, they put a hijab, keeping the whole front so open, really, Bangladesh should not have kept them. And I don't think Iran or even in India, in some parts of Muslim, so Muslim towns, they won't exist. But they now fight for their choice, disregarding the fact that girls as young as four years old uh, are put in a hijab by whose choice? But this is something that makes me think more like, OK, so is that the, the far right people that we should chase up? Or um, should I chase up my friends who are arguing for their choice? Then there is the third one, which is the most complex. As a women's rights campaigner in the UK, I found that is most ridiculous are more difficult to deal with. And it is the unintended collision by complex agencies and confused individuals. For example, um, you know, my, my, uh, in one of my seminars just three weeks ago, there was a seminar in politics in the course in Introduction to Politics. And I have shown some footages uh, in a seminar session on power and authority. And the, there was four minutes footages on the video, you know, uh, what happened to Maria, Maryam Namaji, our organizer in Goldsmiths College, when she went to give a, a talk there. She was intimidated and she was totally like, the whole event was nearly disrupted. So I showed uh, just some few uh, footages to give students an understanding of where is the power coming from, what kind of authority was in the room, and so on. So one of my uh, students, when we saw this, I wanted to see what's their reaction, how did they analyze in the light of the theories we have in place. And then one of the, the first reaction was that uh, one of the, uh, she's black, uh, British, uh, Caribbean origin, really wonderful critical student. She said, I think the power is that uh, this uh, woman uh, acted as an elite and was trying to, uh, to oppress the, the students and ignore the students in the room as minority students. <laughs> so here you go. So I have to stop because Peter will not let me speak again if I don't. <laughs> but I just wanted to point out these three levels that I will keep coming back when we engage in the discussion. That I feel that in this kind of situation, as really if we want to work as frontliners or even at the back, back uh, we should be taking more responsibilities and challenge these straight away, but more strategically. Because when I have a full uh, classroom there, you know, I have to think of who can get offended by what. You know. And so how do I tackle this? But there is only 15 minutes left, so I couldn't finish the discussion. So yeah, I will stop. Uh, Sadia Hamid. Uh, so actually, I want to talk about um, the collusion of so-called human rights organizations with uh, religious fundamentalists. Um, I was really disturbed. I read the full 56-page uh, document, the verdict, on uh, the RCRBB case. And within that document, uh, 
the, so the first 10 or so pages was just glorifying the blasphemy laws of Pakistan and Islamic blasphemy laws. Uh, furthermore, they, uh, this is something that was new to me actually, in 2009, Pakistan, the Pakistani government presented the United Nations Human Rights Council with a resolution asking them to condemn the defamation of, a, of religion as a human rights violation. In the, within that same month, the 26th of March 2009, the United, uh, United Nations actually adopted that, resolu that resolution. Um, so basically imposing an international blasphemy law uh, to restrict free, uh, human, our human right to freedom of speech. Uh, then on page 10 of that document, they boasted about how their government was, was successful in imposing global <coughs> limitations uh, against any attempt to defy religion or belief on the basis of freedom of expression. So with their newly gifted powers, uh, Pakistan was able to ask um, uh, Facebook, Google, YouTube, Twitter, and etc., to report to their federal investigation agency, so the FIA, which is similar to like uh, the American CIA, uh, to report to them any individual or groups on these online platforms committing blasphemy. So I, as a spokesperson of CEMB, receive text messages uh, uh, and online sort of interactions from people in Pakistan who have uh, been, caught, uh, been texted or WhatsApped by the FIA uh, after they have made a statement or said something uh, even slightly blasphemous on uh, any platform warning them against uh, behaving, in, behaving in blasphemous ways because it is against the law for them. So I'm actually really worried about this because in the long run, what, what this does is embolden not only the religious right, but the far right too. If you limit freedom of speech, the far right use it as a, uh, as a mantle that we are being, we are being uh, prohibited from speaking and they have all the rights to speak. But also, furthermore, it just it feeds into uh, people's uh, people's kind of uh, sensibilities and like sort of their, the things that they're massively sensitive about. So it, this later on, in uh, within a few months of um, this resolution being passed, there was a woman in Austria who uh, I think a lot of people would have seen here. The European Court of Human Rights upheld a conviction of. Uh, basically blasphemy in Austria, where a woman had spoken about, uh, called Muhammad the paedophile in one of her lectures. Now, on the basis of one person in that lecture hall being offended, she was then sentenced to a fine uh, and also potentially six months imprisonment if she, wasn't, uh, if she didn't pay that fine. So this is how it's manifesting for us now, but also how this affects women. My clothes are blasphemous. I'm offending religious sensibilities by by dressing simply how I do. This will snowball out of control and it is affecting all of us. And it's not gonna stop. Um, and actually the origins of, of uh, you know, protecting religious sensibilities came from the right. In Britain, certainly, it was Thatcher who fed into the Islamist book burners. You know, uh, she was looking for a convenient crisis to deflect from what she was doing to the working classes, the, the issues that would have affected all of us. Now to have left-wingers and human rights organizations joining in with this mantra is hugely devastating for all of us. That's all. <laughs> Finished by saying that's all. <laughs> that was a big statement at the end, but thank you. Um, so next we have uh, Rumana. No, no, sorry, sorry. sorry. <laughs> my, my, my apologies. <laughs> my apologies. Um, Stasha <laughs> Ziovic. And you'll correct my pronunciation. Ziovic. <laughs> okay. Savage. Ja 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 <laughs> but, uh, just let me know. <laughs> <laughs> I get two minutes better. <laughs> that is good. Okay. Yes. 
I have two minutes, okay? Yeah. Because my, yeah. my surname is very difficult. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what I don't know really want to speak. For example, I remember I now I decided to speak because I am I was born in one socialist country. You know, ruling party was communist party, as you know, no, and uh, it was uh, Yugoslavia, as you know. That in that time, uh, 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 in the middle of the eighties, I was leftist uh, dissident at that time, and also feminist activist. And in that time, uh, 84, 85, the research was. Uh, something more than 20% of, uh, of, of people in ex Yugoslavia was uh, believers, you know. Nowadays, you can imagine that in Serbia, <laughs> that in Serbia, there is 97% are believers or Serb Orthodox Church believers. You can imagine what's happened with us, who we are not believers. We are continue to still be uh, atheists. It is not so dramatic, please. It is so... <laughs> It's not so dramatic, because, because, because what does it mean this? Uh, it's very difficult to speak about uh, uh, funda religious fundamentalism, nationalism in Serbia mm. and in Croatia, also, especially that it is political religion. It is the main tool for aggressors' war, for expansionist uh, politics during the 90s, and also it is for chauvinist uh, uh, nationalist uh, uh, mobilization in Yugoslavia. And we decided, and it, it, we don't have time to speak about the crimes committed by the Serb Orthodox Church, but some of them, for example, <laughs> some of them, you know that they used to not only the, uh, uh, the mobilize people uh, for wars, in function of wars against others, but they hate more, not others, they hate more us as others in the proper nation, you know. That's why we are Muslims, we are Albanian, we are... But they libel us, you know, because why they libel us Muslims? Because, because we take care of victims of crime committed by Serbs. They are Muslims in our, in our uh, region, and also Albanians, and also Croats, and so. And uh, yes, and they, of course, like everywhere, they prefer fundamentalist, Islamic, or Catholic. The, the biggest problem, we are, are in inner internal enemies and uh, uh, mercenaries, anti-Serbs, etc., etc. And, uh, and also, uh, the, the, and we decided to make some, ridiculize them. Any situation used to ridiculize them and to make, <laughs> to take off uh, their monopoly on, uh, on streets and also monopoly or social, no, social, spiritual life. Because what does the spiritual life is religious, be religious everywhere in our countries, you know. <laughs> and, I remember, yes, they, yes, we, they, they, you are not Serbs, for example. I'm not, I don't be, uh, pronounce his ethnical terms, of course, no, never, never. And uh, yes, yes, we are, you will recognize, we are traitor, we are transgressor, we are against you because you, you blessed war criminals and you support fascist Clero fascist organization who attacked us permanently. We, ten, we have now 10, ten cases in, in a court, in the Belgian in Serbia court, none in favor of us, none. It is interference of Serb Orthodox Church also, but not only pillar of uh, uh, fundamentalism and uh, this kind of uh, ethnic fundamentalism. It is not church, it is also youth organization, it is academy of sciences, it is government, regime, etc., etc. And also they are the creator of educational policy. And in front of patriarchy we made, I'm rec I recognize, I'm, I recognize, I'm atheist, I have nothing to do with you, and also I'm, uh, uh, I, I, I decide I'm transgressor of all national consensus. Does mean what does mean hate other? It is yeah. I have nothing to do with your your uh, uh, you know your policy. Anyway, not only policy, and we share distribute. I, I, now in this moment, I, this, they use a server to the church. They use distribute this everywhere in the streets. Last calendar of their religious uh, ceremonies, because now nowadays everywhere is religious ceremonies. It is you know, who are we are uh, we are out. It is we are we are social demonizing. Atheist is labeled nowadays as some kind of uh, uh, of bitches. You know we are black witches in the street, and they tell, e, you are using our black color. Our color." 
is black. And we are using, but we, of course, we use, <laughs> we, we try to, yes, they use not the, their symbols and in total opposite way. This is the books for their religious calendar. We use it for our, what are we, for our edition. Every citizen should, what every citizen should know about the secular state or what citizen about the crimes of Serb Orthodox Church, etc., etc. And also, Bad, uh, very, uh, thanks to God, and this is the one, not Nedam Pare Crk. I don't give money, any pen to church, and, and show in the public, it is so important. And, and also, uh, thanks to God, I'm atheist, and so. I read this. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and so, no, no it is maybe, we do not get that. And, but, uh, uh, for example, the, uh, and also they blame us as, uh, the low, very low, uh, low rate worth of <laughs> in Serbia. There is the, uh, Serbia because it's the lowest in Europe, you know, because of poverty, because of uh, mean women's autonomy, etc. No, women's autonomy from socialist time. Because not this abortion. For example, our research showed that 60% uh, of believers of this percentage they are for abortion. This is the especially women of my generation. This memory of socialist time. This big. Uh, Big, 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 I think, big, uh, big issue of uh, uh, socialist era of abortion. But the problem is that among young people, it is, it is quite different anyway. And they told us, ah, you know, with feminist love, black bitches, Serbia will, will, will die because they promote always uh, extinction of our nation. We, from my generation, how I can, I don't have a reproductive capacity, for example. And they, they told, and yeah, that's why. And they blame us and tell it, no, 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 they are nothing to do. They are like Albanian, they are like Muslims from and they are Roma, is because they have uh, uh, best, best, better, uh, we tried like Serbs because they are terrorists or fundamentalists, etc., etc. And so this is kind of discourse uh, supported not only by Serbs, but also by academia people, but some part of academia people. And uh, of a lot of them, I will not try, have time to, to speak in which uh, manifestation of uh, manifestation of desecularization in our country, also the organization of the state. I only focus on this as, uh, as the, how we overcome, how we try to overcome and challenge the confront this problem of uh, cultural and moral relativism in our country. As I saw, you know, we work since the beginning with the victims of crime committed by Serbs. It is very important, according to our feminist ethic, we go everywhere in FX if also uh, uh, supporting, we go everywhere to, as you know, a genocide committed in Srebrenica. We work very, very hardly, very hardly the last 20 years since the beginning. Uh, uh, genocide was uh, uh, with Muslims women, especially Eastern part of, uh, everywhere, but in also in Western, Western East, Western, or Sandrak called Maria May visited. And uh, yes, and it was very difficult for us what to do now. Heavy, we are finishing. We have right to the critique uh, abuse of religion in minority communities, especially from the, from the point of view of aggressor state. We are from aggressor state, and what to do? And we discuss, and yes, all my friends from Muslim, again, Bosnian women know that I am atheist, and they are proud of this also, they explain it. <laughs> and this, it was the create the space of create the space for our dif recognition of our uh, uh, differences is very very large, uh, uh, but not. And I finish. It is according to our feminist ethic is don't be fooled or don't be deceived by first by our our, our own, but uh, neither of others in the way. And that's why I think that as feminists we have to be have consensus that all kind of nationalism, militarism, and fundamentalism is against women, against others, against, uh, yes, yes, mm. others. Anyway. And finally, Mariam Ale Lucas. I want to speak about the collusion between the Muslim far right, or the fundamentalist, if you want, and uh, the colon colonial vision of the natives, and how we, we here, in a way, support some of their claims unwittingly. So don't throw stones at me, but <laughs> I want to make this point. <laughs> 
Ah, we speak constantly of Sharia. Now, I want to also tell you what Sharia is and is not. It is a notion, a concept, which has been propagated by the Muslim far right with the idea of inculcating to all of you and to us also in the, in the countries where we came from that something exists which is one law or one single body of law, laws which are common to all Muslims on all continents and at all times and that this is divine law. Now, any serious research shows immediately the vast diversity of laws which exist in so-called Muslim countries or Muslim majority countries, but also among minorities like in India. It shows immediately that, for instance, if we look at the rights of women, in some countries you have equal rights between partners in marriage, and they claim this is in perfect conformity with Islam and it is Sharia law. In other countries, as you all know, we have no rights and the husband has every right. And this also passes off as Sharia law. Uh, or else, take the example of the seclusion of women, no right to work, no right to go out. And in other countries, women are head of states, like in Bangladesh, for instance. All this is always said to be in perfect conformity with Islam and is labeled Sharia. So we should be very careful and not use this term and find another term. It's not because the British government agrees to call it Sharia that we have to agree to call it Sharia. So if we look at this diversity and even this conflict between the laws in different countries, I think we should be very clear that this is, this is very obviously man-made. It's also undemocratic because at no point do the people under these laws vote them, vote for them or against them. And if we look at what the fundamentalist, the Muslim far right has been doing for the past 30 years at least, they pick and choose across regions of the world, across cultures, and across schools of thought in Islam to pick up the worst possible practices and incorporate them in a syncretic body of God knows what, I don't even know how to call it, <laughs> not, not a law, and call this Sharia. I could give you examples, but I'm afraid Peter is not going to allow me more time to do that, but maybe in the discussion I have numerous examples to give you. Now, what happens with the colonial powers? For instance, Britain, the British Raj in India, or secular France in Algeria, they did exactly what the fundamentalists were doing. They pick and choose among various interpretations of religion, but also cultural practices. They added bits of colonial laws. They added their own invention. Let me mention that in the 90s, what was sort of incorporated, incorporated in what the fundamentalists were depicting as Sharia law, the interdiction for women to go to the hammam and to wash. Interesting. <laughs> so we can see that in both cases, whether it's colonial powers or the Muslim far right, they manufactured a law for indigenous people with the idea that we are different. Both colonial powers and the Muslim far right insist that we are different. Mm -hmm. And therefore, we are kept whether, for instance, as minorities in Europe, but also in our own countries, under cultural arrest we are not allowed to enjoy the same rights as um, all the other citizens. Normal citizens vote, but we are supposed to be under laws we cannot change by our vote. Minorities 
are second class citizen in that sense, because we, we are told that as Muslims, or supposed Muslims, because if you declare yourself an atheist, you will still be considered a Muslim. Um, we are put under laws. We, uh, under the colonial rule, we could not enjoy the same rights as the settlers did. In Algeria, it's very uh, clear because everybody was supposed to be a French citizen, but there was an indigenous code which denied us some rights. And today in the UK or in other countries, some citizens, British citizens, who are born of parents who were migrants or grandparents who were migrants are still denied the enjoyment of the same rights as the former colonizers. Mm. And all this is done, and I want to underline this, in the name of our human rights. And we have to denounce the world human rights organizations, international human rights organizations for doing that. So we should not adopt the language of the enemy. It carries a lot of philosophy <laughs> with it. Um, and we should fight the colonial apartheid <clears throat> under its present form. <laughs> what we're going to do now is open it up fairly briefly to contributions and particularly questions from the floor to the panel. So, who would like to ask something? Hello? Peter, do you want to take a number of questions? No, or? one at a time. Okay. Yeah. Hi, I've got a couple of questions. Um, first, Miriam, in relation to what you just said about not adopting the language of the enemy. It seems to me that the enemy <laughs> has also... Can you speak up, Marion? Can't hear you. Oh, sorry. It seems to me that the enemy, so to speak, has also adopted uh, the language of liberal social values and secularism and transferred the prestige of those terms over to ideologies and policies that have no relation to those values. So it seems to me that it's gone in the other direction. But I wanted to ask another question because we've been talking about the collusion of the British state on both panels today. But um, it seems to me there's also a lot of collusion amongst the liberal media, the mainstream liberal media, where we almost daily hear about the white nationalist far right. We, there's a conspicuous absence of any discussion of the fundamentalist far right. Why is that? Actually, we will take a couple more. Can you summarize it? Mine's a quick question to Marie May as well. Um, Marie May founded Women Living Under Muslim Law, which has been an incredible resource for many of us in the room, but I'd just like to hear her thoughts about where that organization is today. Can you repeat that, sorry? Because I'm writing them down for her. Um, so women, she founded Women Living Under Muslim Law um, as, a, as a laws, um, as a network of, you know, um, of women um, as a secular organization. What does she think about what's happened to it now? Okay, brilliant, thank you. I'm Nadia Alfani, filmmaker from Tunisia. Uh, I wanted to ask you, Mariam or the others, you know, uh, do you think, because I was thinking when you, you were speaking about the colonization in, in North Africa, because I think, uh, I remember, you know, a, a lot of laws <coughs> now in civil laws, you know, in Tunisia or maybe in, in Algeria too, or Morocco, uh, are coming from the colonization. I think about the law against the alcohol, you know, that we, we don't have the right to, to drink alcohol when we are Muslim, mm. you know, uh, or drunk people. <laughs> so it, it, it means, you know, if you are Christian, you can drink, but if you are Muslim, you can't. And in Tunisia, they, ad they, um, they adapt a little bit this law because now it's only on Friday, you cannot drink when you are Muslim or during Ramadan, you know. Uh, 
and uh, also the law against the homosexual, because you know in Tunisia now there is something like more than 70 homosexual in jail. In, in, uh, but during the dictatorship, this law was not uh, uh, applied. But uh, now, uh, because of the Islamist uh, and the power of the Islamist, you know, they apply this law. It's also a law coming from colonization. And after, the, at the end, the law, uh, you know, that uh, authorized the, the Jewish people to have the French nationality. And I think it was the beginning of the separation, you know, between citizen in, in our country. Do you think, all of you, if, if we teach more the history of our countries, maybe we can make understanding better our people, you know, where, from where we are coming, you know? Because in North Africa, we were barbarian, and after we were Jewish, Christian, and now they said we are all Muslim, you know? Take, take one more back there. If we, can, if we can go straight to the question, yeah. that would be useful. Um, I know One Law for All suppo supports uh, lesbian and gay rights, which is great. Obviously, they're forbidden under Islam. Um, and I believe there was a fatwa in the 1980s saying that if a man is like a woman, i.e. gay, he should transition into a woman. And obviously, transgender people should be respected and have full human rights and protections yet there are no long-term scientific studies that show that changing your gender is beneficial. So I'm asking if the promotion of, tr of transgenderism, as it's happening currently, to many young people who are vulnerable through their youth, through their autism, and often through their mental health problems, is this promotion of transgenderism a form of collusion? Is the third sector which so loudly promotes transgenderism colluding with Big Pharma, who is making so much money out of it? And is this a substitute for addressing a sexist and misogynist society? Right, we have four very important questions. And I would like the panellists each to take one of them and answer very briefly so we can get more questions in. So if we could start with Pragna and go on the line, just about one minute on one of the points, or briefly on two of the points. But it's impossible for you to answer all of them. So I'll deal with the question of British state and liberal media. I think the problem we have in Britain today at all sorts of levels, at the level of media, at the level of state, the level of um, third sector and academia, is that we have a politics of illiberalism masquerading as liberal democracy. And that is the issue about, and at the heart of that, is the bankruptcy of where identity politics have got us. Because, you know, the media, why does the media talk about the far right and not the fundamentalist right? It has a lot to do with the way in which left activism, liberals, and academia have come together to deny that space, to be able to challenge fundamentalism because of this idea that there is a binary struggle and it is one about you're either with us or against us. So you're either fighting the far right or, you, um, are, um, or you're either far right or you're fighting the, uh, the, the far right. So we have a situation where it's very, the left and academia in particular have found it very difficult to grapple with the idea of simultaneous struggle against all forms of oppression. And that is something that is hard to do on the ground, but it must be done. Because if we don't, then we are colluding in this whole atmosphere where identity politics has just been reduced to name calling and abuse, particularly on social media. And we cannot have debates and, and, and air our differences in a way that doesn't result in your transphobic, your homophobic, you're a radical feminist, you're a you know, liberal feminist, and so on and so forth. We ourselves have contributed to part of this toxic atmosphere, so I think it's really important that we recognize um, that there is more than one enemy if we're talking about equality, justice, and freedom, and human rights, and the universality of human rights. The far right is 
an enemy, so is the fundamentalist right. Um, and we have to tackle both because both are pernicious and both are bringing the world, I think, and I will say this later in my closing remarks, to the brink of fascism. Um. <laughs> Let me answer your question about uh, the colonial laws in, in almost all the, I would still say, like most probably the global south, uh, where these colonies um, were. Uh, they have actually, because this is London and most probably I can say this, they have fucked us way <laughs> more, many more ways than we can actually imagine. Yeah. They're everywhere. Uh, they're everywhere today. They have been there for hundreds of years. I'll just give you a couple of examples. In Bangladesh, the ICT Act, the Internet Communication and um, the, the Technology Act, which just got revisioned because you know, there are a lot of uh, uh, criticism about it. And they came up with a new law called Digital Act Law, which is pretty much the same thing uh, in a, with a new name. This is essentially, this law is a 200-year-old um, British law, a semi-blasphemy law, which said you can be punished for hurting religious feelings, you know, or hurting someone's feelings. There is no clear definition of what it means. You know, it, it, it is being used in so many different ways today. And um, if you just ask a question, an 18-year-old was arrested by the government for saying, how many wives did Mohammed have? You know, that's all. That's all he asked. And he was actually bitten up, and then the government decided to arrest him. So, you know, this is just one example. The, the law against the homosexual, you know, homosexual gays and um, others, the, I think it's called, it's, um, 371, which was turned... Seven. 317, yes. 377. Three seven seven. Right, 377, which was actually um, reverted in, in India. Yeah. Um, but in Bangladesh, you know, we have never heard about these laws, like the one ICT Act 57 that I just talked about. We have never heard it when we were growing up in Bangladesh. These are the laws which has been there in, in, in you know, which hasn't been taken out from the old British laws, and now the government's very conveniently bringing the, those back. In Bangladesh, we have, you know, homosexuality it was always a taboo, but we have never heard that the government got into this business ever and arrested for someone for being homosexual. But now they have started it on the basis of this law, 377. And to answer your question, yes, we need more education. We need to fight these, uh, these old laws, which were based, which were created on the basis of the divide and rule policies and other, a lot of other colonial policies that the, you know, these colonial powers needed at that time. So um, education, uh, is, will be most probably the most important thing at this point to fight these things. Well, I'll just keep it very brief and then pass it to Sadia because she will answer the question for, but I just want to add a bit to um, what we have just heard about the Bangladesh thing. I, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm not sure really. I feel like, yes, of course, I completely agree with the fact that um, colonization is a big problem and then we are still juggling. But my question is that why am I juggling still? Why do I need to find out that horrible law that never was there before? You know what I mean? So I find because that that's kind of like letting, I'm participating in the collision myself by saying that, oh, well, you know, the British state has put that in and then I can now allow my government to do that. I mean, I just can't believe when I, uh, when the hit list, you know, when I first saw that um, he, as an enemy of Allah, that those 21 people would be killed. And I just thought, enemy of Allah, I really don't know who Allah is. So I can, how can I be an enemy of Allah? 
Do you get my point? So that was after Bangladesh government has passed a law through the parliamentary assembly and they have sanctioned the law for me. I like to find out the agents in my current situation and the agents in this room who doesn't like me stand up and say, I want to talk to you, not that who provoked you to talk to me. I mean, that is my very discursive notion, you may like or not, but I find it is a convenient way to put the blame to the past, you know what I mean? Rather than challenging the present. And that is why I was indicating that when a student uses Gramsci's post-colonial theory to analyze the event in Goldsmith College, and then I have to say that, oh, while well, you sounding like those LGBT feminists who said that the Islamist guys were charming guys. So, you know, that really paralleled. So, I mean, I'm, I'm not completely opposing, but I am a post-colonialist feminist myself, but I'm very conscious about the fact that we should not only dig into deep th into the past, but challenge the present, do something now. I'm just conscious of my very bad chairing, plus some excellent <laughs> contributions. So we are fast running out of time, so the remaining three speakers have only got two minutes each, and you right, must really okay. stick to it, because we have to wind up. So, okay, I'm, I'm just going to be really, really quick. Actually, for, for me, one of the reasons uh, myself and uh, a friend of mine set up Critical Sisters was because what we saw in terms of the discussions that were occurring around transphobia and the discussions that were occurring around um, uh, Islamophobia, the tactics were actually the same. It was about preventing any discussion. Now, it doesn't matter. <laughs> It doesn't necessarily matter what you're, well actually it does matter if you're an actual transphobe or if you're an actual, you know, uh, anti-Muslim bigot, that matters. But the discussions around uh, both issues need to be had and it was that that was being prevented. So we set this organisation up to be able to challenge the fact that we're not being able to have those discussions. Um, and I think when you've kind of uh, given way to one group for preventing discussion, you have to give way to other groups now. And eventually it just gets out of hand. I mean, uh, what was it, a couple of weeks ago, a friend of mine uh, showed me uh, some guy uh, who's now saying I'm actually 40, uh, 20 years younger than I am. And uh, you have to give me that right, that's my right. Well, this is going to carry on getting out of hand. And, you know, somebody saying, actually, I'm a different race than I actually was. There's some things that you can't deny. Facts are facts. Uh, so, you know, uh, it, it's a, it all becomes around preventing proper discussions and just... Uh, Leveling the charge, the charge of bigotry to prevent any proper nuanced discussions. So that's where I'm. But I'm not going to go into masses of detail because we haven't got time. Yeah, I said that the fundamentalists pick and choose the worst possible traditions. The more repressive laws. Uh, then they call call that Islam when they say it's Sharia, and then they propagate it. Example, Tunisia. Uh, female genital mutilation is a practice, a cultural practice. It was pre-Islamic, yeah. uh, which, which originated in Egypt, the civilization of pharaohs, and then was propagated to the sphere of influence of ancient Egypt, Sudan, etc. And now we see preachers coming to North Africa, where it is unheard of, and saying, you have to practice this, otherwise you are not good Muslims. Now, similarly, the wali. The wali is a tradition of North Africa. We have it in Algeria. It, a woman is never an, of adult age. She always has a tutor for any important thing in her life. The tutor will sign the contract, not her. Now, I have seen this propagated in South Asia. Mm -hmm. where it, it was unheard of. So that's the type of thing the fundamentalists do. They label it Sharia, and God knows what you are going to have here under the label Sharia. <laughs> now, I just want to give an example about colonial laws, how even that is incorporated. And as you know, in Algeria, we had a 
long and terrible liberation struggle, seven and a half years. So in 62, when we became independent from Fr French colonization, to our utter surprise, we discovered that the, the old natalist French law of the end of First World War, which basically repressed any even knowledge, let alone practice, uh, regarding contraception and abortion, was prorogated in independent Algeria. And when we say, what the hell is that? They say, no, no, this, this is Islam. So these are examples about the syncretic nature of what they dare call Sharia law, and we should not accept it. Now, there was something which was addressed specifically to me, which is, what do I have to say about the situation of the organization I founded and where it is now? I presume this is the network Women Living Under Muslim Laws. And it's a very good example of what happens when an organization which was extremely decentralized in the sense that everybody was independent and, and having their own priorities everywhere throughout Asia, Africa, and in countries of immigration. Suddenly, we had an office where young women who were born and raised in Britain had the final say on many decisions. So we come back to the question of racism. Mm -hmm. uh, because there is discrimination, mm -hmm. no doubt, against minorities in Britain, yeah. then they started being defensive of everything which was labeled Islamic. Whether it was or was not is out, it's not the, the real question. So this is something that happened, and I have not been part of this network for at least two decades now. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, 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 no, I would I like that. <laughs> Mariame, Mariame was with me. Mariame is my friend and teacher and a lot of history. <laughs> you remember Mariame when about the construction of this identity? I remember, you know, during the Ramadan, we were in Bosnia and they told, no, no, we will not use alcohol. I told, no, 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 it is not true. During socialist time, all working class people <laughs> use alcohol. Please give me beer. I <laughs> and now, yes, in a way, beautiful relationship, not only give me the beer and we join it together, but also they are Muslim, <laughs> also <laughs> Raki. And so a lot of issues they, they factor, fabricate eh, for our common uh, uh, enjoy. Yeah. But I am concerned what has the, the our problem is, I think everywhere is the uh, very few women groups you uh, 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 oppose to clericalization. Because it is seen as their identity, you know. Mm. And because of practical, we isolated, we are very isolated, isolated by their society, by their families, by community, isolated by government, of course, isolated by donors. Because in name of tolerance, in name of multiculturalism, USA imposed, of course, the project against abortion, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It is very, very big, big problem, and we have to be, uh, uh, we have to uh, take that in mind. This is my one of the biggest concern about this, but not about alcohol. It is not problem. Yet. <laughs> <laughs> We've had some fantastic contributions to the panel. I'm sorry if we didn't get all the questions answered, and I'm sorry we didn't have time for more questions. Uh, but we have heard some great insights here from women on this panel. Um, I think the message from this session is that non-white women, especially women of Muslim heritage, are some of the most persecuted women in the world and often some of the least supported. But thankfully, you are here to say that you stand in solidarity with all women everywhere who are struggling for their liberation. And there can be no women, no liberation, no human liberation without the liberation of women. So please join me in giving a huge round of applause to the panel.